Okay. And it gives you an opportunity to actually um, leave if you don't want it recorded. <laughs> um, can I start with just if everybody can just introduce themselves in the club that you're from, just so everybody knows everybody else. That's uh, good. Um, so can we start with you, Jill? Uh, okay, I'm Jill Lancaster. Um, I'm from Kerry Kerry, but I'm president of the Bay of Islands Kaikoui Photography um, Club. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, welcome, Jill. Pauline. Hi, I'm Pauline. I'm from Gisborne. I've just taken over presidency and then COVID hit, so Wendy's part of our club and she's helping me through this. She was right. the outgoing president and I'm the incoming, so. That's, that's cool. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, John? Hi, I'm John Smart from uh, Wanganui Camera Club. Three years as president now. So. Okay, cool. Uh, Paul? Uh, I'm Paul Conroy. I'm from Hibiscus Coast. And I'm eating my dinner as we speak, so hence that why I'm not on the video. <laughs> so, excuse me. Okay. So just a question, Paul. Hibiscus Coast, is that, are you inside lockdown or outside of lockdown? That's a uh, we're, 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 we are well within lockdown. We're doing Zoom club meetings at the moment and workshops. Oh, okay. Cool, cool. Um, Wendy, Pauline's kind of introduced you. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so I'm Wendy Campbell from the Gisborne Club. I um, have just um, yeah, recently completed my three-year term as president and um, happily handed over to Pauline. So. And I'm continuing on as immediate past president for the next year anyway. Okay. Oh, wow. Nadine? Um, hi, I'm Nadine. I'm from Timaru I'm in the South Island here, and this is my first year of presidency. So, yeah. Cool. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. And Shannon, you can introduce Mel as well. <laughs> um, I'm obviously Shannon from the Wellington Photographic Society. Uh, this is Mel who's also the treasurer of the Wellington Photographic Society. Uh, she provides a bit of help with all sorts of bits and pieces as well. Um, yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. And Angela? Hello, I'm, I'm Angela Harris from Cambridge. And as of last night, I'm starting my second year as um, president. Oh, hold on, are we? Nope, I'm not muted. So, no, no, you're not muted. Cool. That's cool. Um, and Mel K, but you will need to unmute. That's, uh, that's me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's just so that we can share any links and anything as we go through. And... Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Yep. Right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, there's really only one sort of little housekeeping thing that I wanted to discuss with everybody um, prior to um, Shannon coming in. And that's, um, I sent an email out to all clubs a couple of weeks back now with regard to New Zealand camera. So um, according to our publishers, it's on a boat that should be arriving in Littleton Harbour on Saturday. Um, so, um, Hopefully, distribution of it to members who have nominated clubs will be within the next couple of weeks. Um, but after receiving an email from actually from Wellington Photographic to say that they were still sitting on large numbers of books for last year, I actually asked everybody, could they please go into the club part of the website, PSNZ website, and check the names of all of the people who have nominated the club for which to receive there. And if there are people there that you have no idea who they are, or you've got no connection with, with them, could you please let us know? Um, and what we will basically do is we will pull them from the club lists. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because the last thing that we wanna do is get into a situation where um, we're making clubs do more work than they need to. Um, uh, and uh, equally, uh, we don't want members turning around and saying, where's my book? Um, I had a look at one club today and I seriously wondered why I'm 
given that it's a club in Wellington where one of the persons listed on the club, their home address is Napier. So they've yeah. obviously moved and they haven't updated the club information. Um, so in terms of um, sending New Zealand camera out uh, for clubs that are in Auckland, obviously we're going to play that by ear in terms of whether um, what level you guys are in. Um, if you continue in level three with no opportunity for clubs to meet, then we will basically hold the books until Auckland is at, is at level two. Uh, because again, it's just um, avoiding um, any unnecessarily work on everybody. Um, Cool. Um, right. Okay. Well, without further ado, um, I've asked I asked Shannon some time ago. In fact, Shannon approached me some time ago as well. Um, are you you still president of WPS? You're about to stand down. Um, I down? probably should have um, been finished by now, but since the um, coronavirus. Has kind of extended lockdown um, past our AGM. We haven't been able to meet in person to have our AGM to get our new president in. Right. Um, so unfortunately, I've had another month or so, um, <laughs> longer than I expected. Um, but hopefully, over the next month, it will be the, my last month of the term. So. Okay. That's Fingers cool. crossed. That's cool. Um, so, over the last, have you been the three years? Or two years? Uh, I've been on the committee at Wellington Photographic now for seven years, I think. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So some of the work I'll talk about tonight started back when I first joined. Okay. I'll see. Um, right. Yeah. Um, Shannon run, has run a very successful um, use of social media to actually attract um, people to actually come and look at um, Wellington Photographic and it has been, you know, very successful in terms of recruiting uh, large numbers of uh, new members, but actually more importantly, um, younger members. I suspect that, that his efforts have actually decreased the average age in that club by quite a bit mm. in yep. over recent times. Um, and we're all, um, you know, painfully aware that the that a, a clubs are aging, uh, and that the, if the photographic society or our clubs even are to survive, that we have to actually attract younger photographers. But in a lot of cases, um, uh, people actually have no idea actually how to to do it. Um, so we've asked Shannon to basically share some of the. the secrets or the recipes or what they've actually used um and um yeah so hand it over to you shannon um screen share is enabled so if you want to share something or not sure okay so we will do as we go along um i guess the main thing is um it's more marketing than social media so i guess that would encompass facebook instagram twitter um mailing our members and our website as well um and probably any communications you have with the wider public as a as a whole thing um okay well just bear with me i've got hay fever and i'm <laughs> <laughs> a bit of dog right next to me licking itself so um basically we'll start with when i joined the committee about seven years ago the average age of our club is about 60 plus and I think we had at the time around about 70 members and it was on a pretty noticeable decline um, at that stage. And what was noticeable, there was a very kind of stale atmosphere. They'd been doing the same thing with their program year on, year on, year on. And they were starting to see a pretty heavy decline with their numbers. So what we came in and did, and Mel has helped with us along the years as well, as we thought, what do we want to achieve with going forward? Do we want to bring in new members? Do we want to 
lower the overall age of the club? Um, do we want to provide overall exposure of the society to the wider Wellington community? Um, do we want to interact with sponsors and local businesses more often to use their skill set and sponsorship money and all their tools to help us going to help them? Um, so where we got to that, first thing we did was we decided to establish a brand for the society. Um, so part of that, we've gone, what is the general purpose of our club? Uh, what is the club's mission statement? I will, Mel will share some information with you now, <laughs> if the dog complies with me. Um, I can get that up as well, if possible. She's just taken my notes away from me. <laughs> Hold on. I kind of had to. Hold on. So Sorry. Just bear with me. Um, so if you just click out of that for a sec. Sorry. Just killed it mid-flight if you just share the whole link there. Um, just so you know, I've muted um, everybody else. <laughs> okay. So we don't grab the attention. Um, but if you um, want to ask a question, Sort sure. of, um, Sorry, we'll be able to hand up or problem. use the reactions. Yep. Sorry, little technical <laughs> issue. All right. All right, there we go. So I've just shared with you a folder of some of our, it's not all of our stuff, but some of our marketing material we'll use. And there is our club's mission statement, uh, which should, should be the first document you should be able to see in there. I'll just go back to my notes. Which also, <laughs> all right. Sorry, bear with us. All right, establishing a brand. Um, the basic goal was the previous look of the club from the logo to the website for social media to the newsletter was pretty poor, in my opinion. Um, and is really tailored to members of the club that had been there for like a longer period of time, but not tailored in any way to. Uh, somebody who's just bought a camera, someone who's at high school learning photography, uh, someone who's just retired and picked up a camera. All those people are coming in and finding just like coming to a meeting or getting a newsletter and just going, what is this? I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what these competitions are. I have no idea what these special interest groups are and so on and so on and so on. And people were coming in and then just hitting a wall after a month or two and going, well, I have no idea what's going on here. And just going, well, why would I continue? It was a bit overwhelming. Yeah. Um, so from that, we've gone to go on how, when we're talking about a mission going forward, how would we present our club to everyone from a newcomer to photography to an experienced hobbyist? And our basic goal was to create a professional look across every single platform we have. So everything that's public facing. So everywhere you interact with the public. Um, so that's your website, your social media platforms, uh, mail you send out to around exposure, um, not exposure, sorry, uh, exhibitions and such. We wanted everything that went out to have both a professional look and to be cohesive cohesive <laughs> to have a cohesive message basically saying this is what we do and this is why we do it and this is why it'd be great if you could come along and possibly have a look and if you're interested in taking part here's how you can do so rather than having a two-page list of rules or <laughs> definitions and such and such um and just putting people off from the onset um so as part of that redevelopment we did, and I should add, this didn't take that long either. It's probably about a week's work total. Uh, we looked at our logo. We looked at all our design elements. So that's everything across our website and social media and mail. Um, our social media headers. So that's your photos that go on top of your Facebook page, business page, uh, your Facebook groups. Um, we looked at our website and with the website, we pretty quickly discovered that if we were going to attract new customers to that, we were going to have to build a brand new one. Um, so I'm just lost my note there again. <laughs> um, I think the important thing is to get across here is how, if you're looking to bring in new members, 
um, whether they be younger or whatever, you need to present yourself in a really cohesive fashion to the public. Um, the way you might explain something to an experienced member is not the same as you explain something to someone who just walked off the street and opened a web page and said, I'm looking to continue or explore photography. So for, for, for example, like someone has brought a camera at a camera store and someone at the camera store has recommended you should join Photographic Society. So they look you up and what are they finding when they find your web page or their Facebook page? Are they finding something useful for them to kind of explore their journey forward? Um, for us at the time, it was a lot of just kind of useless information and kind of confusing rules and such. A lot of stuff about competitions too, which for a new member can be a bit intimidating. Um, yeah, it, it was just a bit, it was all information that was tailored to people who already knew what was going on yep. rather than introducing them to how the whole thing works. Yep. So we changed that up. So... Um, with that in mind, if you have a quick look in that link I sent you, um, there is our mission statement, which has been, I think, recently just done again. There is an overview of the society, which is, I think, recently just been updated. Um, those are kind of key tools if you're looking to begin your marketing journey uh, before you even think about advertising or putting anything on your website or social media. You need to work out who you are and why you do what you do and how that translates to a potential new member. Why do people want to join? Yeah. So there's a couple of things in there that you guys might find useful. There's a welcome guide that we send out to brand new members. Uh, there is a planning manual, which is intended for obviously committee members on our side of things, which details, it's a little bit old these days, but details how we post to social media, how we email people, how we put stuff on the website, and just kind of breaks it down into a little bit of a schedule and what to do and what not to do kind of deal. So I just let me open my notes then. Cool. Um, I guess the next thing we'd probably talk about, you right there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Next thing we'd probably talk about there is uh, messaging. Uh, you need to be pretty definitive on who you want to attract as new members, whether you want uh, young younger people, so teens, students, uh, people doing university. Um, do you want young professionals? Do you want people that are recently retired? Um, for us, we've broken that down into a couple of different groups. So we have a, a youth membership policy where if you're under 18 or you're still in high school or you're first year of university, you are free until you turn 19. Um, we found pretty good success with that so far, but the message we send out to those people is very different to someone, to messages we send out to our members and messages we might send out if we're trying to attract kind of someone who's recently retired and just bought a camera. So it's worth keeping in mind that there's no one fits all solution for that. Um, Keep in mind, these are just broadly kind of how we categorize people. It's not only people who have just had their first grandchild and want to take cute pictures of them like it's just a way of putting demographics to groups yeah yeah and when attracting each group it's very and when posting stuff anywhere with your website or social media very very important to think about what someone's seeing this message for the first time for like this is their first interaction with your website or your social media um, what are they going to get out of it in that messaging? So you need to have a clear, like, why? Like, why should they join? Um, what is it that you do? Um, why they might be interested in taking part in your camera club or society? Um, and then we kind of break it down a little bit further. We do a little survey when new members join. We kind of find out where they are in their photography journey whether they're just starting out or they're looking to make money from their photography or they're a new grandparent who just wants to take better photos of their kids. We try and find out where they are so we can put them into not so much a pool, I guess, but... But we can point them to other members who can support them in that journey and we know what 
activities might be of interest to them so we can kind of point them in those directions too and um, the whole idea is to help them learn and to help them grow and we can't do that if we don't know anything about them yep yeah i guess the next part of it is for each of you go through the platforms that you have obviously all of you will have a website hopefully um i imagine a few of you will have a facebook business page um I'd be interested to see how many of you have an Instagram. Um, considering we're all photographic societies and camera clubs, it's pretty key to have that if you're trying to attract younger members. Um, I think, and I mean, don't be too frightened as well. We talk a lot about marketing, demographics and such, but it's not as much work as people make out to be. I think people make a huge deal of this. And to be honest, we've nearly we've doubled our membership in the last couple of years but we're also on our platforms our website now has from when i joined it's about three or four as time many times viewers come to the, the site each month and we've gone on facebook from about 400 to just under 2000 and i think about 900 followers on instagram as well and that's not actually from doing too much it's just been really consistent and making sure when you have a really good speaker or exhibition or something you'd really like to share with the public that each time you go out and say something and put a message out there um it's not really a huge amount of work it's just been making sure you have something that you want to show off and then you can show off to the public as well it's, it's been the biggest thing for us yeah. um so for example in the last year we've had or last two years we've had a bunch of New Zealand's kind of best photographers come in, um, like Catherine Cadnatch and Esther Bunning and such come in. Um, but we've also looked, we look at the amount of people that turn up. We look at the amount of people that look at our messages on social media to see if that's any interest to in the public as that goes out. Mm -hmm. um, we have found actually the most popular thing we've done in the last two or three years has been film. So we've had speakers come in and speak about film processes uh, speak about the type of films they shoot. Um, we had a film competition three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, each of those kind of meetings has pretty much been standing room only. They've been so packed. Yeah. There is a huge amount of interest, particularly in the kind of younger generation. That resurgence of film is huge at the moment. So if, if you're looking for a topic to attract newbies and hipsters, Yep. That's a really good one. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the key things we do is um, the Photographic Society, um, we get together and have a program meeting after the AGM each year, which has obviously been delayed a little bit this year. But we all get together and plan out a program for the following year. And this is pretty key for like, if you're going to do any marketing planning or anything going forward, you can say, hey, we're going to hit these subjects or these speakers. And then we can go, hey, we're going to, Put some effort into advertising this to the public. So, for example, Esther Bunning, we put a quite a bit of effort out there in advertising that. Um, versus, you might have your internal competition nights. For us, we have a print competition and a projected image competition, and generally one other thing. But we won't advertise those to the public at all. There's not much point for us to advertise those things which would make very little sense to a member of the public so we kind of use our efforts or use our energy wisely i would put it so we're not trying to expend yeah. the effort where it won't be useful if that makes sense <laughs> yeah. and money as well if you're going to be doing any advertising on facebook or other platforms and you want to invest some money into advertising just target towards the um the activities and the audience that you want to attract you don't need to advertise everything you're better off doing a little bit better than a lot not so well yeah and i think it's probably key to say as well like your social media really is not about advertising to your members you should have direct line of contact with your members via mail or some other way or via your website Social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter are about advertising to the public primarily. So try to get out of that mindset where if I'm putting something on my Facebook page, it's not meant for 
members of our club. It's meant for a wider audience than the public. So any mess messaging that needs to go there goes out as the voice of your camera club or society. It's not Shannon Doyle slash president. It's Wellington Photographic Society when those messages go there. Um, and I think also like brevity is key. Like I've seen a lot of people over the years put up a 300, 400 word kind of dissertation on Facebook. And on Facebook, you only see this little top part of it. You'll see this like when you're reading up and down there, it has the see more button you click mm -hmm. on. Don't spend hours writing something for social media or Instagram. Write 50 to 100 words. And then if they need more information, they can go to your website or you can email them via your contact list instead. Um, it's You can spend a lot of time writing stuff which no one's going to read. So no one ever reads. They call it a break point on a website or social media. No one ever reads but below that break. So I think it's what 80 percent don't read it yeah um it's so any important information put it in the first 50 send. words if you can um and then send them somewhere else have a link that takes them to more information that might be as an event that might be as a um an article on your website or a post or something um but you don't have to have that information available exactly in that one spot if you can direct them somewhere else yep yeah it's kind of important if you want to sign your members up as well you want to direct them away from those platforms to somewhere where they can get more information about your club and sign up as well so you want to not just direct them to the sign up page but direct them to a page with more information and then have somewhere really obvious saying membership or sign up or such and such um as part of that sign up page, make sure there is a payment option available right there. That will increase your um, your actual conversion rate to members significantly. Yep. So a credit card option via PayPal is quite a good option. It's free options. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, we found over the years that um, we had a sign up form on a website, but it was bank payment. And people, what happened was people were signing up and then by the time they got around to payment, they'd changed their mind or did it on it or had second thoughts and they decided they didn't want to be members anymore. And we found that was happening just a bit too often. Yeah. So immediately as you sign up on our website, you are directed to a payment option as well. And it's worth noting we don't, we don't do the financial year thing where you have a less payment. How would you say that? Uh, so we have basically rolling subs so if you join in july you're you renew in july if you join in january you renew in january uh, it makes some things a little bit more difficult but it, it increases conversion and retention rates yep yeah, exactly um just really quickly we'll talk about the tools we use and then we'll get into some back and forth um we don't use any paid tools to do all this marketing um facebook does might be in a bit of a pain in the ass sometimes. Um, does have a really good marketing tool for creating posts on your business page and groups and also Instagram, which means you can kill two birds with one stone there. Uh, it's called, the tool we use is Facebook Business Suite. So if we need to do anything important, like say we had an exhibition next month, we would go and pre-schedule all those posts. So we say we want to, in the month leading up to an exhibition, we'd have, in the first week, we'd have one post, one or two posts second week would have two or three and then the week prior to the exhibition would have three or four posts and we just sit down and schedule those in one go that probably doesn't take any more than 20 minutes um that also means we can do that at the same time on instagram as well and you can see how they look on both platforms um and if you did want to spend a little bit of money in advertising there um which i wouldn't recommend doing straight away um we can do it in there as well um the other tool we use, probably a little bit less these days, is um, Later, which is an Instagram scheduling tool. Uh, so we have in the past, um, we've kind of fallen off the wagon a bit with COVID recently, but we normally try and schedule Instagram posts um, up to kind of two months in advance. So we just put photos out that her members have provided for competitions and meetups and such, and we'll put them on there. We'll tag that member if we can. 
it'll provide credit to that member as well. But we also use that as a way to kind of attract attention to the society as well. And the society's activities, because yep. if that's what the, um, where the image is originated, you can kind of mention it, you know, taken at our last, I don't know, South Coast beat up or something like that. Yep. Yeah, and I guess the last one we use, um, MailChimp, I don't know how many of you guys use this, but, and I definitely recommend using it if you use your Gmail or Hotmail or whatever your web services, um, email services to email your members. Um, MailChimp is basically a mass marketing service. So we can have lists for, we have lists for members, we have lists for the wider public. So if we want to advertise something really broadly via email, we have that. We also have lists for, what's the other one? I forget. Um, Sponsors and such like that. So people that have provided gifts and bits and pieces to the society over the years, we have a list for them as well. It just means we can be a little bit more deliberate when we're sending stuff out. So for an AGM, for example, that would go out to only members. Um, but if we had a really good speaker in that we wanted to maybe get the public in for, um, we'd send that out to the wider public and probably our sponsors as well. Um, if we've got a workshop that we want to advertise, that would go to either list depending on the nature of the workshop and how many spaces there were, that kind of thing as well. So you can be quite, and you can create new lists for different emails too. So if you want to send to a very specific group, you can do that. Yep. Um, it's just much better to use that than your, your normal email service provider because with that you do risk um, being labeled as junk and having your um, service disabled. Um, whereas something like MailChimp is the whole point of it is to do um, member emails and things like that. Yeah, I think something as well though, it's a, it's a privacy issue as well. We can't be sending out, because we've got 150 members, we can't be sending out emails all those members in the CC field, um, that is a bit of a privacy violation. So yep. you can't do that. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful there. Um, I think that might be it for tools and stuff. Um, what I will say, is just generally though, you, you need to have a clear idea of what your target audience is gonna be so you can go out to them. And you need to have, that needs to key back into what your program is gonna be for the next year. So now it's coming up to the point we should start to have some planning for what's going to happen next year, um, provided we have a, a relatively COVID free, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff we do, as I said, we sit down in November, we say, hey, this is roughly what we're going to do for next year. Um, these are our competitions we're going to have. Um, and that provides us an opportunity to go, well, here's a good opportunity to get younger members in. Um, so and such. Yeah. we also look at what activities are going on around the place. So one of the things we picked up in the last couple of years was Pride Month. So Pride Month is a great month to bring in an entirely new audience. Um, so we did a lot of meetups around that. Um, we had people who went and attended the parade. Some of those images ended up in our exhibition this year. Um, that's an opportunity to to get new members, younger members. We also had um, invited members of the Rainbow community to come in and talk about their photography and their experiences in photography. And that was fascinating. They were, we had two younger guys um, come in and give just a wonderful presentation. And it was a point of view that was quite new and unique for a lot of our members. Um, so just opportunities like that, like what's going on in your communities that's different that might be of interest. And that's a really good way to kind of, to look at your program and potential new audiences. Yeah, it's important not to rehash what you've done last year and the year before and such. I mean, I think that's, that's great for your members, um, but you need to have something that's going to Attraction. appeal to the wider public yep. as well. Like otherwise, I mean, that's a lot of work we do is we sit down and hey, so this is what we're going to do. And we will we'll plan stuff for the members so they can have their competitions and all their meetups and bits and pieces. But we'll say, hey, this has been popular in the community in the last year. So we've looked at 
what's been happening in PSNZ and NZIPP and such our Facebook groups and look at what people have been taking photos of, what they want to take photos of and say, hey, this is what we can do. Thinking about things like techniques as well, what do people want to learn how to do? So another one that we've done is sports photography. And we've done a few different sports photography things this year. So I'm quite heavily involved in motorsport and we have quite a spectator friendly event each year um, that I invite people to come and take photos. <coughs> um, we also have um, members who've got um, contacts in football and rugby and those kinds of sports and arrange meetups to go and take photos of those. And they're quite a good challenge for people who've not done that kind of photography before again potential new audiences and people see these images too so that's you know it's always opportunities just techniques is another good way to kind of think of what people want to learn so how can we engage them yeah and just kind of lastly we'll have a bit of conversation off this um there's a couple of things in that link we sent you um we have provided flyers to every camera store in town so for us that's one of photographic supplies and photo warehouse and splendid um we have a free youth membership which i've talked about here um we have provided that to art teachers at the various high schools here um we've um also advertised that through facebook as well um we also occasionally sponsor competitions and we provide as part of that a free membership voucher so i'll say like hey uh the champion club or the mountaineering club might be doing a photo competition with their members and we'll they'll have approached us and said what can you give us and we'll go we'll give you such and such a print voucher but we'll also give you a free membership voucher which means we kind of get that person in the door we are paying for that privilege obviously but more often than not that person they've already got pre-established interest in photography which more than often means we that we retain that person for that second year um, I mean, those all little bits and pieces just start to add together. Yeah, yeah, and it moment. can take a little bit of time to to build that momentum. But if you just put a bit of time and effort into that, into the foundation stuff, your messaging, your channels, and your tools, you'll really start to start seeing results. Sorry, I'm just getting a phone call. <laughs> it's great timing. So. I guess now's a good time to ask if anybody's got questions. Is everyone? Feel free to unmute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of information, so I'm hoping there are questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just one job. Can I just ask how often your club meet when you are meeting? Let me turn that back on. Um, it's twice a month at the moment, but we have, in the last three years, decided to have two monthly meetups as well. So yeah. that'll generally be like a trip down to the coast or an astrophotography um, evening once a month. So it's two in-person meetings at our hall that we have established, um, and then two kind of field trips meetings as well. Thank you. Um, do you guys do Zoom meetings for your club nights or um, has everybody got to meet in person for that? So last lockdown, we did a couple of them. Um, in my opinion, they're a little bit shambolic because <laughs> we, um, we had a couple of members host them and they're a bit all over the place. One of them was quite good. Um, the other two we had are a bit, um, yeah, not, not as good as I would have wanted. Um, and we've also been hearing back from various people that I think with the amount of Zoom meetings that have gone on over the last year, people are getting a little bit fatigued with that as well. Um, so um, when yeah, lockdown um, happened again this year, we tried to have smaller meetups. So we've limited to where possible, uh, five to 10 people and then social distancing being in place as well. And then yeah. gone and photographed um, down by Capital Island or something like that, where we could have be A, be outdoors and B, um, be a little bit safer with it as well. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether giving people the option might encourage some of the younger people 
to attend the meeting virtually, whereas, you know, if they came in person, you know, certainly in our club, um, I think younger people feel a little bit um, out of place because most of the members are, you know, a very older generation. Um, and, and thus far, I've only offered Zoom meetings to people who are otherwise incapacitated and can't yeah. get to a meeting. Um, and we don't have too many youngsters as members. In fact, I don't think we have anybody probably under the age of 40, I don't think, as a member. Maybe not quite 40. But, um, yeah, I just in my, in my mind, you know, just while he was talking, whether anybody's experienced uh, an uptake in attendance if if Zoom is made an option for, for club nights in general outside of lockdown. <laughs> um, I'll just go really quickly. Um, we haven't found that at all. Um, we found generally it's the older members that kind of want to join those Zoom meetings. Um, all the younger members are the ones that are pushing for us to have meetings again in person, yeah. um, which <laughs> we're not, um, not planning to do anytime soon. Um, no, I mean, we've kind of taken on a duty of care for a lot of our members, we feel, and don't, we just want to act in their best interest. So we're holding off on in-person meetings for a while still. At least we get back to level one. I think. Yeah. Um, important, <laughs> just really quickly, um, about the age thing. Um, the Photographic Society was really bad at that. Um, I first joined the club nine years ago, maybe. Um, and I first walked up to a meeting and it was the most unfriendly atmosphere. Everyone was mid sixties and I was in my thirties. Um, it was a really, I think there's a big barrier for them to get over initially. Um, the biggest things we've done to kind of attack that are to give away free youth membership. So if you're in high school, you're a student, your membership is going to be free until you turn 19. Um, because the only way you're going to attack that is by just almost giving it away. Yeah, the um, it takes a little bit of a critical mass as well. The first three or four are going to feel awkward because they are younger than everyone else. So you just have to make them feel as welcome and as engaged as possible. So they keep coming. They've got yeah. friends or they might know other people. But, you know, when your next younger member comes along, it's good to see a similarly aged face. Yeah. Um, so the the more you can kind of keep them coming, the better. So talk to them, ask them what they want to learn. What do they want to see? What do they want to hear about? And, but don't do you have too over the top. <laughs> do you have youth grades, do you? So instead of like throwing them in with the adults, you know, normal C, B and A grades, do you have something specifically where the young people can compete together and, and have young people's um, club competitions? Um. No, um, and we've done a couple of surveys in the past. We found when we were pressing the, the competition issue too much, it was really, really off-putting for new members, both youth and those that are older as well. They coming in as a new photographer and just being slammed with all this competition stuff or having mm. your images critiqued at a competition in front of 60 other people was quite an off-putting experience. And a lot of people have... Mm. Mentioned so we do it like anonymous survey every now and again, and a lot of them mentioned that. Um, so we have de-emphasized the competition, the like outright competition part of it. So we still have competitions, but we have said we have quite clear guidelines that for our judges to say, hey, you need to be what's the word constructive, constructive, to, constructive yeah. and positive with your comments because. It's a really off-putting experience if you're however old and you've just picked up a camera and you've made your first print and you bring it in for this competition and there's people that have been doing it for 40 years mm. and then you come in there and you get this yeah. well you know what you know it can be very disheartening yeah um and if you want them to keep coming you don't want that experience mm. so so what we do is we bridge that now we have um smaller meetups um, every second month we can bring along prints and just show them off among a couple of people mm -hmm. in person and just talk about them and get feedback from other <clears> members. <throat> so that's kind of between five and 10 people 
um, we found, as I mentioned, like having a big competition and then it's pretty nerve wracking and you guys will know this, putting your image up for everyone to see. And particularly, I think if you're a new member, they were just, a lot of them were getting put off by it, frankly. Yeah. And we also don't do grades in ours. So we just have um, kind of a runner up and an overall in our competitions. We only have the two per year. Um, and then we have the inter-club one within the Wellington clubs too. Um, but in terms of our own competitions, that they're, they're quite, not necessarily bare bones, um, but we try and keep them as simplistic as possible so that everybody can enter. Um, and it's more about entering than it is about winning. Hmm. Yeah, just to help you, know, I've got a little folder. I'll chuck in that um, link I gave you as well. When I find it. <laughs> okay. ah. Shannon, while you're looking for that, um, I know that when you first came in and you started suggesting to change things in the club, um, you met quite a bit of resistance from some of the older members who were quite comfortable with how the club was operating. How did you actually get around that? Um, <laughs> I feel kind of worn down to a certain point. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, the way we've got around that is we've had results. Basically, we've had proven results by people coming to meetings and getting engaged and stuff. Um, there's a few members that are still around that are obviously quite stubborn, and you probably find this at your camera club as well, um, that have come in and they've written, sorry, written all the policy and all the bits and pieces of the club over the last 20 years, and they're expecting to find that each year as they come in. Oh, yeah. um, it's a law of diminishing returns. You can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over. <laughs> you can't keep doing the same thing over and over because you will see less and less return going forward. Um, and I've explained that in numerous, numerous times to people. Um, but I think, thankfully, the majority of our membership gets where we're trying to get at, um, that we're trying to provide something not just for them, but for the society to grow and stay healthy as well. Um, because if you sit in the same place, like you're going to be, we've seen a few Wellington clubs con Croy has just gone into hibernation because they have no one to take over the management of their club currently. Um, Johnsonville came pretty close to shutting down this year as well. They're starting a little bit of a recovery at the moment, but unless you move with the times, um, you will not be around in 10 years. I mean, that's make no bones about it. Like if you think today, well, hey, we've got. 50 members we're going to be okay keeping things the way we are i mean that's not not the case i mean you have to be proactive about everything you do and and the thing is now photography is so accessible everybody's got a camera on them all the time with their phones so actually that's another thing we do is we run every couple of years a mobile photography competition and that's a public competition that everybody can enter um, with just the caveat that the photo has to be taken in the greater Wellington region. Um, and that's another great way of just making people realise that photography is for everybody. So, Yeah, just on that point, we have it's about seven or eight members I know of that have don't have a proper camera. They have a cell phone or a smartphone mm -hmm. as their primary camera. So they don't own a DLSR or a film camera or anything else. They've just got a mobile phone and that's what they take photos with. And they're good photos. Yeah. Mm. So we try and encourage that as well. Like you don't have to have a brand new camera. You don't have to have the fanciest lenses. Um, if you're stuck, we have older film cameras and older digital cameras will lend you so you can get started as well. So we get obviously members of the public donate stuff to us. Um, we'll provide those back to people in need that want to explore photography. Um, I, I, yeah, I think there's a bit of an attitude sometimes from older mm. members particularly that you need to shoot them in such and such a way. And mm. I think that mm. we try not to encourage that because I think that's mm. quite off-putting <laughs> to potential members. Yeah. I mean, on, the, on, the subject of, yeah exactly. on the subject of club equipment, um, we bought a, a very good printer for our club this year um, with the view to trying to increase the number of prints that people were doing. And we've seen the prints uh, grow through the roof Yep. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're charging costs plus a few percent, you know, so pe people are doing prints for less than $5. 
um, a prints, and we we've got a bunch of slipping mats for people. So you know they can buy a slipping mat for ten to fifteen dollars, depending on the size of the mat, uh, and it's reusable. So they're not paying thirty, forty dollars um, every time they need to stick a print in, and they're getting uh, schooled on things like soft proofing and different papers and um, you know everything that comes along with with printing and that that's worked really well for us yeah um thankfully first we've got a pretty good relationship with um wellington photographic supplies so we get i think it's 50 percent discount on prints so that works out a little bit over 10 bucks for a, roughly a 12 by 18 print um and i think we were planning to do something very similar to what you were doing there um but last year kind of happened <laughs> and we haven't been able to do that since um i think it's a good idea providing you keep the cost down of course so like a sponsor would be pretty key there i think yeah i mean logistically it's a bit of a pain because you need somebody available to you know to drag the printer around or to you know to have people to go but to, to somewhere to go um but having having people sit in front of a computer and learn how to print themselves is uh has been real beneficial to our members yeah well, i think that's a good idea i mean i think anything we can get people in a practical sense get people in practical skills with a minimal amount of equipment as well so you we try not to do anything we need a specific lens or camera or anything like that it should be doable by someone that has a smartphone a film camera and so on um so we've we haven't really explored kind of things like macro photography very much because obviously you need a little bit of specialized equipment for that. Um, we try and keep things and our meetups and our practical sessions kind of applicable to everyone where possible. But it's nice to be able to do things like printing and that as well and show people in person how things work. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a bit late in this conversation. You may have already covered sure. it. But um, how do you get the younger people through? We, we have a, a lot of problems trying to recruit younger people. We go to the schools and that, and we had a, a couple come along at the start of the year, and then the, there just doesn't seem to be the interest, unless they're actually playing Xbox or something, of coming along and doing it. So what I would say to that is you need to go where they are. So if you're approaching their teacher or principal or whatever, we found that pretty ineffective. To be honest, there's a lot of really big high schools here. We have approached them all, um, tried to speak to them. We provided flies and pamphlets and that had pretty much zero response. Um, so you go where they are. So Facebook is an older demographic. Facebook is mid thirties and higher. Yeah. Um, so then you look at that, that's not gonna find you any younger members generally or less younger members. So the next step on that from that is Instagram where that's where a lot of those younger photographers are going to be and that's where they're going to be showing off their work. So that's where you need to be as well if you want to attract them. Thank you. That makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you. I think the other thing too that, that's, that is relevant here is you, you touched on critical mass and that's that, you know, I've been to a, a couple of the sessions where yeah. you'd heavily advertise them on Facebook and, and you know, they were targeted for the general public um, yep. and it was it was quite interesting because you go to them and there wasn't one person there there was 13 or 14 yeah um, and in fact it, it was quite amusing one night because um, Shannon had the invitation at seven o'clock which all the club members knew was seven for 7 30 but yep. the people on Facebook didn't know so at seven o'clock there was a dozen new young photographers and at about 7 15 some of their older members actually started to wander in and it was it was amusing to see the shock on their face when this room was filled with people who they um, didn't know and were considerably younger but I think the thing is is that in that time those younger people that actually were talking amongst themselves and then Shannon and a couple of the members were doing we're trying to do the rounds and saying hi, you know. Um, but literally, it was almost a 50-50 mix 
by the time that the meeting actually started. So it wasn't one young person coming in feeling completely overwhelmed by lots of people. If any, if anything, it was the club members feeling overwhelmed by all of these visitors. Oh. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will say probably one of the bigger changes we made and one of the most effective changes we made is we moved, as Paul just talked about there, we moved to open our doors at seven o'clock and then half an hour of kind of time where people can mix and grab a cup of tea, um, a biscuit or whatever, and talk to other members. It used to be that everyone would file in just before 7.30. The lights would kind of go out five minutes later, and that was it. As soon as the lights came back up, everyone would leave again. So no one ever talks to each other in that kind of situation. And I think you need to have some kind of, something built into your meeting nights we allows members to socialize with each other as well. And it's one of the best learning opportunities for newbies is that that half an hour or so um, to, to just sit and talk with other people who also might be new or who might be incredibly experienced. Like it's a really, it's the best time for them to share. Yeah, um, just on getting the young members there and numbers as well. Um, one of the easiest things we've done along that lines is approach a bunch of mass university photographers and say, hey, would you like to come and speak with us? Um, we'll give you kind of 25 minutes each to show off your work. And then obviously they come along, they're a bit younger, but they brought all their mates and all their family and all those yeah. people with them as well. So all their crew with them. And quite a few of those people signed up on the night as well. So that's one of the easier ways you can do things. Just approach a high school or a local polytechnic university and just say, hey, like, we'd love to hear from some of your young photographers. Yeah, get them involved. Like they, a lot of them have been learning already and they have some skills and they've got a body of work. So let them show it. And if they feel like they've got something to contribute, they're a bit more likely to keep turning up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, has anybody else got any questions of Shannon or Mel? Uh, you've been mentioning, Shannon, about some documents you were giving us. I, I don't know where to get those from. So if you look in the chat of this, I can see how oh, yes. right. there, yep. there's a link and there'd be a whole bunch of stuff in there. Oh, okay. Thank you. So let me know if you haven't found that and I'll send it again. Um, yeah. Shannon and John Smart here. So thanks very much, uh, you guys. So um, pr pretty interesting. But you, you keep saying it, it's um, it's easy, I suppose, is, is how I'm interpreting. I, I, I suspect it isn't easy. Um, and I suspect you've put a lot of energy and a lot of time and a lot of effort into it. So uh, so I think, you know, it's, uh, you know what's going to happen when you're not president next, next year and, and so on? So how do you get a legacy that continues on from, from the big push that you've got it started? So do you think it will continue on or, or, or whatever, because oh. I, I sort of feel everything you've told me tells me that was a lot of work. Yeah, I mean, it's important to, I don't feel I've got it across in this um, talk, but I don't do all of it myself these days. When I started, I did. But even then, I was only spending kind of maybe five hours a week on the actual marketing, social media stuff. And that was spending, in my mind, a lot of time on it. You shouldn't be spending more than 20 minutes and my, I don't spend more than 15 minutes doing it when I do it at the moment, and that's probably once a month. Um, so it's pretty minimal upkeep. I think what, getting started, I think you're right, does take a little bit of effort, but that shouldn't be one person alone. I think where a lot of people get stuck is they go, they'll tag this person to do all the communications for them, and that is by far and away the wrong way to do that. <laughs> you shouldn't have one person trying to do your website, your social media, your mail out to members and that as well. You need to be splitting that up among people on your committee or among your membership to do that for you. And you should be prioritizing scheduling as well because that is the big time saver. Every time you sit there and do something like two days before an event or whatever is when you're wasting your, no, sorry, not wasting your time, but spending more time than you need to spend. I mean, it's important to budget your time so you don't spend hundreds and hundreds of hours doing stuff um but as you say like in terms of legacy 
um, the, the best thing you can do is to look at your membership as it stands and work out who's got a similar vision to you in terms of wanting to, to take this forward and to encourage these new members and what are their skills and how can you utilize them and how can you get them on that committee? <laughs> Um, that's the best way. Have them on the committee and create a committee of committed people who are interested and engaged. And that's what we've managed to do. It's taken a little while, but we've got a really excellent committee these days. Um, yep. It's probably the, the best thing you can do. And when you've got these new members coming in, ask them straight away. I and mean, we've already asked a few people who have only joined in the last year if they'll join the committee for the next year. Get yeah, them in as quickly as you can. Yeah, I mean, just just really quick on that note, don't ask someone on a committee and have them do hundreds of hours of work. No, just, just so that they can see what goes on in the background and so that they can feel involved. And so they've got some buy-in to the club. That's mm. quite important. People are a lot more invested if they feel like they have a say in what's going on and that they can make a difference. Yeah, I mean, in terms of legacy and stuff like that, um, we have a pretty pretty strong plan, almost like a business plan um, that we have. I've got an older version in that link I sent you. Um, but we, we have a stated set of goals that we need to achieve each year. And we try and go out and set that every November when we do our program meeting. And I think, I think key is if you have people on your committee that they still can enjoy their photography, <laughs> that they're not working so hard that mm. they have no time to go and take photos themselves, yeah. if that makes sense. So they'll those people come back and back and back and back and are committee members each year versus like previously when I joined, uh, the president would have done kind of 25 plus hours a week and they got pretty burned out pretty quickly by doing that. And same with the secretary and the competitions person as well. So it's about spreading that load and then that provides a bit of encouragement to everyone else, yeah. I think. What, um, could you just indicate, so uh, you're, you're sending out of your messaging, are you um, spending money on Facebook, um, boosting posts and things like that? And if so, what's your sort of marketing budget? So we do very occasionally, we will do that. Um, for example, I think we did it two or three times last year. One was our exhibition. Uh, the second one was Esther Bunny, because uh, we, as part of the deal with her coming to speak, we wanted to get as many people there as possible because her sponsor was coming along in the evening as well. Um, and da, 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 that was the other one, Catherine Katanich, maybe, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I think it was Catherine. Um, keep in mind, I don't think we spent more than 20 bucks on each of those. Um, and we easily recruit that kind of three or, two, three or four times over. So for each of those, we had, oh, maybe excluding the exhibition, but those other two, we had at least three or four members per meeting sign up. So if I think it's memberships 86, is it? 84. Okay. Yeah. And well, four times yeah. 84 is a lot more than $20, obviously. So we recruit that a couple of times over. It's just been, I would say with Facebook advertising, don't spend a lot of money early on because you're just throwing it away. You need to have a little bit of a, a basis of, um, followers or whatever on there before you start spending money. Otherwise, you're just throwing it into uh, a bin, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and the it comes to that critical mass point again. The more people you have engaging with your Facebook or social media, the more social media shows it to more people. So, at, to start with, it's not about boosting posts; it's about putting up posts. And the more often you do that to a point, you can't do it too much because then it's just too much saturation. So it takes a little bit of finessing to get it right in the first place. But you, if you do it regularly, a post or two a week. Um, or even less. Then. Or, yeah, even less. And it has to be about something so that people will comment on it or engage with it, even if it's clicking on it to like it or something. That will just show Facebook that this is something people are interested in so it'll show it to more people once that starts happening more then it's worth spending a little bit of money but only on things that you really want to actually get 
um, a, a good showing for. Yeah, I think as a starting point, just pick two or three events per program, per program calendar. Um, say your exhibition, for one, would be a good point. If you do an exhibition, that is. Um, say you have a really good landscape speaker or wildlife photographer, that could be another one. Um, and possibly whatever the other one is. But only when you're starting out, just to focus on two or three things that you think will appeal to a wider audience. And say an exhibition, you could share with local community groups as well. Uh, you could share it with the paper. Um, I think the radio might be paid. Um, but there's a lot of free places you can share these things that help you a lot when you're starting out. So I wouldn't expect huge numbers starting out because it's all a momentum thing, right? You need to build, build from where you are and then very slowly build it up. I wouldn't expect to go from a couple of hundred members or whatever to 2000 in a year that's kind of like a three or four five year progress but it's just kind of chipping away at it kind of once a week or once a month or whatever just saying hey this is what we've got going on um if you're welcome to attend uh, for our meeting nights for example we let members of the public come twice free so if they want to see a particular speaker then come along for free and beyond those two times they have to sign up for a membership um, we find most people sign up once they've come to that second meeting they'll yeah they're signing they've, up. they've found something of value generally yep. so, uh, what is your membership fee 84 dollars and 48 for unwaged and then we have a youth membership which is free for anyone up to 18 or in their first year of university study that one can be a little harder to police, um, but most people have been pretty honest so far. So, yeah. When you say unwaged, if, uh, our club probably just about all the members are unwaged, I suspect. Um, yeah, a lot of ours are too. <laughs> yeah, basically, reti basically retired. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or on a benefit or whatever. Or yeah. Some people pay the full rate anyway, um, even if they are eligible for the other one. Um, and to be honest, like that is one of our biggest income generators is our membership fees that pays for a lot of um, extra bits and pieces. Do you have discounts for, for couples? So presumably your $84 is per individual member. We like currently- For couples or a family, do you- We do you don't. Um, we have just two, no, sorry, three couples at the moment. Um, it's something we probably should look at doing at some point, but okay. So we'll at, at the bring it up at meetings. Yeah, I mean it's a good idea. I think a really yeah, good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So currently they would both pay the eighty four dollars. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah, uh, we we have a we have a family membership, so our normal rate is seventy five dollars, but for ninety five dollars, um, you can have three people from the same household come in yep. and a lot of lot of people now bring their spouses uh, with them or, or or one of those grandchildren and, and that works really well for us and um, the other thing as well for our youth members they're free and their parent or guardian is free as well because generally they have to drive them and take them home again so that was free up to age 19 yeah yes right okay yeah. I mean, I think the family memberships and the couple memberships are a great idea. Uh, you want to yeah. encourage more people through the door, <laughs> basically. And if you can twist their arm a little bit by giving their spouse or partner or wife a discount, um, that's a great idea. I mean, all kids. Yeah, all kids, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, part of that is making it um, family friendly as well. So if you're going to get families along, I mean, you guys know this, make sure it's family appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure like some of the old guys don't get too stubborn on the night and argue too much for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. so can i just backtrack i was just interested um in the fact that you've de-emphasized the competition side yeah. of your club but i just didn't quite catch you said how how did you just run a general open competition or so what is the um, so you know, what would the focus of a meeting be? So if you if if you're submitting an image for a competition, 
Yeah. Um, did you say, did you just have sort of a general open? I mean, you don't have grades, so I was just interested how, how you worked that. I, I didn't quite catch all of that, so. Sure, so we have two competitions each year. There's a print competition, which is obviously physical print, and there's a projected image competition, which is pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Um, what we found in the past, and used to be when I first joined, there's a popular vote for the winners on the evening. And we found, and I, I've seen this myself, people voting, people would vote for themselves. And they, they'd bring their mates along, and their mates, they'd all kind of vote for each other. And it was the same kind of three or four people winning everything. And it really, really was a really negative atmosphere. Yeah. Um, so since then, we've moved... Um, First, we kind of went to judging, and then we found we had a couple through that were pretty negative um, and put quite a few people off. There were, um, I won't name any names, but there's one in particular who came along and was criticizing post production uh, techniques and you shouldn't do this with Photoshopping, you shouldn't do this and this and this. And she was putting people on the spot to defend themselves. And we had a big talk about that after that competition happened, and we thought, well, this can't happen again. Um, this was so, there's some, obviously some shy members within our membership and they were, I think they felt a bit attacked yeah. um, on that meeting. So we've gone away and created a set of rules for our competitions that says there's a vast wealth of experience there, but there's also a gap in experience as well. Someone might've just picked up their first camera and gone out and take a picture of a bird or whatever. It might not be that great, but we expect whoever comes in to judge for us to try and be constructive about it, try and be positive. That person should go away inspired to try or inspired to improve their photography, not going, well, this judge was a bit of a such and such. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, you, when, you when you get experienced enough and there is other avenues we can point people in, yeah. um, say Pearson Z or if they want to be an expiring professional we go hey look there's APA, OIPA or NZLIPP and we have also kind of every now and again we have print critiques in person so this small group of people get together and discuss their licentiate for Pearson Z or such so we, we get, kind of identify these people and say hey if you want to get really really into it this is where you go we just try not to um, try not to make the competitions too harsh Wow. So we don't want really harsh feedback. Oh, if that kind of makes sense. Is that yeah, really it, it does. But mm -hmm. in terms of the structure of the competitions, so we have two per year, um, and each has two categories, an open category and a set category. And there is a runner-up and a winner of each as chosen by a judge, or in some cases, a pair of judges. Um, so it does mean that there are fewer prizes to give out, um, which is, we find acceptable. One additional prize that we do have, and I can't remember if we do this for each competition or just per year, but we do have one for best image from a new member. Um, so anyone who's joined in the 12 months or since that competition was last held um, is eligible for that particular prize so that encourages newbies to kind of actually maybe get something out of it as well even if their experience isn't so great right. um, and actually in the last year we've found that the person who has won or people who've won those competitions have also been the new member right okay yeah yeah so Good we idea. do award new members yeah. in competitions as well which is important yeah. to say if you've joined in the last year too have some incentives for their for new members to enter competitions as well because we found as we've said before it can be quite intimidating if you're a new member trying to enter a competition mm -hmm. when you particularly if there's a lot of experience older photographers there mm -hmm. and one of the reasons that we started to move away from competitions too is just there was there's been less and less and less uptake um in them to be honest fewer people have been entering our competitions which has made it harder to kind of encourage people to keep taking part you know it's that critical mass thing it's something that's not doing so well so fewer people are doing it the less people who do it the less interest there is again mm. um 
so we've chosen to focus more on the education and the learning side of things and get speakers in rather than focus our club on competitions right okay i think we're sort of the reverse in our club at the moment aren't we pauline um we're getting absolutely swamped with because uh, we have grades so we have introductory grades. So that's where you knew there's going to be grade, then A grade, and then A bronze, gold, et cetera. Um, but we are having to just, um, yeah, reduce the number of mission entries every month because... They're just going up and up. Uh, yeah. Average of 70 the last two months. So from a club of sort of 18 to 20 regular contributors. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm just interested in... Um, you know, sort yeah. of I mean, the we've got the other so. extreme at the moment too, which is good, but it's also a problem because we can't see that many images to a judge. We we send our images all go externally. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> so um, just too many. So we can't complain that we haven't got, um, you know, enough interest in the competition. It's, it's you know, we're trying to um, sort of peg mm -hmm. it back a bit. Yeah. If you have a look at that folder, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt. Um, there's our outline for competitions and judging in there as well. Yeah. It's not the full thing we provide to judges, but they'll give you an idea of what we do um, in terms of competitions. Right. Okay. In that mm -hmm. folder, that link we sent through. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, thank you. That's all right. Alan, uh, what do you do? Do your members do the external competitions as well? Like your PHNZ ones, isn't it? So out of... Were they all internal? Uh, a few of them. Uh, there's about, I think, 25, 26 members out of 150 that are PSNZ members. Um, I think there's about 10 that are NZIP members, I think. I haven't got the exact number in front of me. Um, but we find the members that are PSNZ members take part in their competitions as well as our competitions. Um, yeah, I, outside of that, I'm not too sure who takes part yeah. in what. Um, uh, there's really, a lot of people that take part uh, in the rest Facebook. To, sorry, go for it. Sorry, no. no. We've been trying to get them through, like, on the trainer Packer shelf and things, you know, all the, the club competitions. And you just, you just can't get them. You've got to beat them around the head with a club and try and get them to do anything, you know? Yeah, I mean, we very much the same for us as well. We have... Um, a committee member in Bronwyn. I've discussed this with Paul early, early in the year as well. There's now a new kind of um, PSZ liaison role within our club. Um, I think Paul's sitting there messaging out to other people as well. Um, but it is difficult to, I think, from a new member's point of view, it's very difficult to kind of explain what these other organisations are. So whether that's PSNZ or NZIPP or AIP or whatever, to a newbie, that's a foreign language. They do not know what that is. Um, they also that's for an, uh, kind of that's more of as you get down the track as a photographer, that's kind of where you might want to go. But when you're starting out, it's very difficult yeah. to kind of explain that and get them interested in that. Um, so what we do is we have obviously the members that are PSNZ members. We try and encourage them to get together and discuss stuff like that. Um, but for the club entries into competitions like Trina Packer and some of the others, um, we encourage our members to, so we have a discussion page on Facebook, which is a place where our members can talk about meetups. They can teach each other things. They can ask questions and things like that. So whenever we do meetups, a lot of photos and images get posted on there um you know just things that people have been doing techniques they've been learning get posted on there and we often use that as a um a little bit of a tool when we're putting competition images together too so we'll sometimes scroll through there and just see what we can find um to put a um an entry together and then we'll ask those photographers if they're happy for that to be included um, because as you say, we struggle to get people submitting stuff. We do ask, but we struggle to get them submitting things that are relevant sometimes. So we sometimes have to do that job of searching. Yeah, I mean, just really quickly on that point, 
when we talk about competitions, that's why we have two competitions and no grading. Because we found if we had a film competition in January or February, a printed image, a projected image, and interclub and an exhibition in one year, that's four or five times you're going out to members and asking for something, for images I'd like to submit. And going above and beyond that is probably more than most amateur photographers produce ones yeah. who have time are quite happy to but a lot of our newer members they have full-time jobs and they've got families and things like that and they don't photography is a, something they do on the weekends or whatever yeah, interest, yeah. they yeah. don't have time to go out and take 30 images for a 10 image interclub competition you know yeah, I mean, so it's worth being wary of how many times you are. I, you can do, obviously, whatever suits your club, but for us, we are wary of asking too much of our membership. We don't want to be putting our hand out every second week and going, hey, can you submit something for this? Can you submit for, something for this? Yeah. We try and keep it reasonable for them. Like. We find if we're a bit more targeted and we do a little bit of that work ourselves and then ask for specific images or whatever, that tends to work a bit better. So we're here in North Tay, we've got 16 members, 16 full-time, not 60, 16. Yep. And but we have an internal competition. Every two months we have a different competition and they're all externally judged. Uh, each meeting night we have what we call a pick of the night, yep. which is either print or digital. And you know, we, we just go through them, show them that, and they, they get ranked by the members. And you're not allowed to vote for your own either. Uh, yeah, and we have um, with our local uh, photographic shop here, they've supplied a voucher for a 15 by 12 print. Oh uh, yeah, and that's the prize every time on that. And we, we get a reasonable uptake on all that. Well, that's up and down, but it's reasonable. But to try and get them to do anything external, it's you know, the old horse to water thing, you know? Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd like to get into them more. I keep saying, the more you make your club visible in that, the more chance you've got of being able to do more things. Yeah, I mean, I think i said it a few times, but you need to have something within your program that applies to a wider audience. So uh, for us, those competitions that we have are probably our lowest attendance of the year. Um, reasonably often um, and then when we do have a nationally recognized photographer or whatever that's generally where we mm -hmm. see higher mm -hmm. kind of attendance or anything to do with film yeah anything yeah. to do with film is a full house <laughs> yeah yeah um, so I mean it's just been a bit a little bit smart about what you do going forward it's just like hey we'll put a couple of nuggets in here for the public and they might be interested to come along and make that free for the public as well encourage them to come along and then you might get a couple of bites off that. You never know. But you want to be encouraging, uh, not necessarily new members, but people to come into your club and see what your club's about and give them the opportunity to sign up. Um, yeah, I think some of the problem with camera clubs, because I've done more research on this, uh, they can be a little bit opaque. And it's a bit hard to know what's going on with such and such a program and such and such a competition. Uh, but every opportunity you can take to get someone in the door and say, hey, this is who I am and this is what we do is an opportunity that should be taken, right? Hey, thanks very much, Anne. Mm. Can I ask a question, please? Sure. Um, we've got a closed Facebook group, which, um, so if you open it up to the general public, um, do they still make comments on it? Um, and you said something about the discussion box. Um, I think I have seen a discussion tab. Can, can that be sort of private so that it is purely just the members or how, how would it work? So our discussion group is private. It's, private it's a private group. So we have two different things. We have right. a business page. Yep which is the public facing one. And then we have a discussion group, which is private and 
you kind of you have to be sent a link or you have to know what it's called to search for it right and then you have to ask to be to join um, same as pretty much any private group um and pretty much everybody in there is a member sometimes there's prospective members who um are showing a bit of interest who will um will let join um and kind of see how that goes if they're active then and they become members they stay if they don't then we quietly kind of remove them again yeah. um but that's a really wholesome group it's worked really well um yeah i mean there's been one or two occasions where some of the older stubborner photographers have spoken up and criticized other people and we've just immediately stamped that down yeah that'll be one of the worst things you can have in any kind of group facebook mm -hmm. or otherwise is people in there criticizing each other um so we've explicitly said that if you do this you'll be gone from those groups and we haven't had a problem i think it's been running about four years now haven't had a problem yeah. since mm. so i mean mm. you can moderate it pretty easily um you can also have uh something called post approval in a group where before anyone posts something you ha has to be approved by an admin yeah. um that's worth doing as you're starting out i think particularly as new members come in yeah. um but that's one of our more useful tools and um, having that um just to be clear um it's worth having a facebook business page so that's not a group at all that's a yeah. a business page on facebook that means when people search for uh, photography your name will come up in a result in facebook it's also worth having then this is free as well a google business listing um that means when people search for photography club or camera club near me or whatever on google your name will come up as well uh, so we get about our google listing gets i think 800 or 900 people go from our google business listing to our website each month mm. so it's a very useful tool which is free and we basically we have never updated that that's just been sitting there and it just it's one of those things simple things you can do that takes you about 10 minutes mm. and it's just endlessly beneficial to us yep. yeah thank you for that yeah, sure. the other thing i would suggest is that um in Facebook, do a search for photographic, for photography and your area and see whether there are actually any Facebook groups that actually exist. Yes. And if so, join up to them because that's a great place where you can actually advertise things that your club is doing. So like in the Wellington area, we've got Wellington Through mm -hmm. the Lens, um, Wellington Photographic uh, Photography Enthusiasts, which is actually a couple of your members anyway. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, and there's something like, what, it's about two and a half thousand members on that second group, I think, the last time I looked. It's a I huge pretty number. significant, yeah. Yeah. And that's a really, um, those are the kind of groups that new people tend to join as well, or younger people tend to join. Um, yeah, they're kind of their interest groups or they're interested in photography and they're looking for somewhere to post their images to show people. Yep. Mm. Yeah, so it's important to have a voice in those groups as well as your camera society or camera club. It's yep. important not to spam in there. Very important not to spam those groups, mm. but just say, mm. hey, we've got an exhibition coming up. Hey, we've got such and such speaker coming up. This is free. Feel free to come along. That kind of thing. Like that's... Is often pretty beneficial like mm. just have a voice in those groups mm. i mean obviously don't be a dickhead um, <laughs> but just keep it short and brief and just say hey we've got such and such coming up if you want to attend you're more than welcome you can do something similar through instagram too um just searching for hashtags that people are using and um in your areas and do use some of those when you're posting too if they're relevant only use them if they're relevant <laughs> Uh, but that's a great way to start pushing those posts out to people who might not see them otherwise, but they might be using that hashtag. I've posted in the chat a link to Impact Magazine, which is WPS's magazine, um, and particularly the January 21 edition, because Shannon wrote a very good article. Actually, I'm assuming you wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Um, on why join a camera club so um i'm sure you'd be happy for 
people to reproduce it. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean that's um, for if you want to share that anywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah, I generally write a lot of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, folks. Well, it's nearly five past nine. Mm. Um, I'd like to thank Shannon um, and Mel for taking the time and, and speaking to us tonight. Um, it's a bit of a pity that there's um, not more people online, but we'll make this available um, as a recording and we'll send it out to everybody. So Hans, you'll actually pick up what the first half of the session was anyway, um, because I think it's been a, a very valuable um, evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, <laughs> Good night John boy. <laughs> Just like that, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Thanks, Paul. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.